Please welcome Kenny Farkson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, last time we were all here as a group, last time I spoke to you was in 2019. And it was quite a tumultuous time in Scottish politics. Uh, a former SNP First Minister had just been questioned, arrested and questioned under caution uh, about alleged criminal behaviour. Uh, and here we are four years later, and another former SNP First Minister has been arrested and questioned under caution about alleged criminal behaviour. It's Groundhog Day, and I'm Bill Murray. <laughs> um, last time I was here, I made a few predictions, and I was asked by the organisers to, to revisit them for us today. So I said at that time that the Alex Salmon trial would be Scotland's Me Too moment. I said that Alex Salmon would claim to be the victim of a political conspiracy within the SNP to remove him as a threat to Nicola Sturgeon's leadership. I predicted a historic schism within Scottish nationalism between supporters of Salmon and supporters of Sturgeon. And I said the schism would focus on independent strategy and culture war issues. I also forecast the setting up of a new populist nationalist party that would contest the 2021 Holyrood elections. So if any, any of you want the lottery numbers for next weekend, <laughs> see me at the coffee break. Um, the, the le obviously, uh, it goes without saying that the legal questions faced by Nicola Sturgeon are very different to the ones faced by Alex Salmon. But the consequences, the, the seismic change um, that each of these bring about, I think it could be actually more significant this time. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to predict three trends that I think we're likely to see in the next few years in Scottish politics. And you can hold me to these next time we're here. Um, the first one you'll, have, you'll already have noticed, Scotland is falling out of love with the SNP. This, this shouldn't be a surprise. The party's been in power now for 16 years, and that's a long time in politics. You can make a lot of mistakes in that time, and the SNP have. On drug deaths, on standards in schools, on NHS waiting lists, on gender recognition, on ferries, on named persons, on sectarianism, on the economy. But in some ways, the SNP can also be seen as a victim of its own success. And what I mean by that is that Scots tend to see Holyrood these days as more important to their lives and their interests than, than Westminster. And you might think this is a good thing from an SNP point of view. It focuses on the Scottish aspects of political life. But it means Holyrood takes more of the flack. The SNP is the government. The SNP is the establishment. The SNP is the man. Uh, the, the SNP is who you rebel against. The SNP is who you blame for the world's ills, if the focus is on Holyrood. And we're, also, we're in the middle also of a deepening crisis of confidence in the political system. And trust in politicians has never been high, but it's getting lower. And the party of government is always going to bear the brunt of people's cynicism. And that's where Nicola Sturgeon's current troubles come in. Because, let me be straight with you, I have no insight into the police investigation. Happily, I have no idea if it will lead to criminal charges or uh, lead to a trial. And if it does come to a trial, I have no idea whether or not Nicola or Peter, her husband, would be found guilty or not guilty. Uh, we are slightly constrained, anyway, by the Contempt of Court Act 1981, which means that I can't say anything about it. And if you say anything about it or you ask me questions about it, I can't answer. And if we answer, we could all go to jail. Um, what I do know is that the damage has already been done. The legal turmoil in the SNP feeds into people's cynicism about politics. Regardless of how this turns out, it feeds the common suspicion that politicians are only in it for themselves, that they're all crooks and they can't be trusted. The disillusionment is everywhere, it's deep, and applies to all parties, including the opposition parties. But the SNP 
as the party of government for all these years is bearing the brunt. So Scotland is falling out of love with the SNP. And we should remember that half the country wasn't in love with the SNP in the first place. The second thing I want to touch on, I want to talk about vibes. A lot of talk in politics at the moment about vibes. And what are vibes? They are the intangible gut feelings you get about something before they articulate as conscious thought. Um, and I'm here to tell you that the biggest threat to Scottish independence support at the moment is vibes. Um, let's look at the vibes in recent years about being British. Okay. We've had Brexit and Boris and Truss and Rees Mogg and Braverman and a world seemingly run at the whim of old Etonians. The vibes about Britishness, about being British, have never been worse. Well, the vibes about being British and about Britain are possibly going to about to change. And here we need to look ahead to next year's UK general election. I think support for independence in Scotland is vulnerable to an incoming Labour government with a radical plan to rewire the British state and to change what it feels like to be British. The man you listened to earlier this morning, Gordon Brown, he was asked by Keir Starmer to draw up a blueprint for mending a broken Britain. Uh, Brown set up a commission and he published his report at the start of last year. Uh, the report was called A New Britain. My favourite story about this, this, this uh, exercise was that uh, the shadow cabinet were handed copies of Brown's report and they were asked what they thought about it and a few of them went, it's a bit long, isn't it? And uh, they were assured that, that Brown was trimming it down. They went, oh, that's fine. So the final report came to them was 14 pages longer. So it's so Gordon Brown. Um, now, it remains to be seen, there's a, a few caveats here. It remains to be seen how much of Brown's blueprint makes it into the Labour Manifesto. It also remains to be seen how that blueprint will fare in government, the various priorities that an, an incoming Labour government will have. And I'm particularly interested in what will happen when a Labour government in Edinburgh begins discussing these reforms with an SNP government in Edinburgh. And my guess is at that stage the plan could grow arms and, arms and legs and become much more radical with Scottish Labour and the SNP finding common cause on reforming Scotland's place within the UK and actually making the Labour proposal, proposal more radical. I think, you know, all the political talk at the moment is about next year's general election. I'm more interested in what happens after it, when all the kind of the hand-to-hand the, 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 the -hand combat and political machinations are swept aside and it becomes a question of how do we improve the country? How do we improve Scotland's place within the UK? So I think that's, that's what we're heading for. So we, we are going, I think, when we think about the vibes about being British, I think we have to s acknowledge that quite soon we're going to see a more powerful Scottish government, the offer of a more powerful Scottish government uh, within a reformed United Kingdom, more power for Holyrood, more devolution for England, secured rights for the devolved parliaments, a new second chamber to replace the House of Lords with guaranteed Scottish representation. And this is where the vibes come in because Labour in power at Westminster, Starmer and Downing Street. Ministers, government ministers in the UK government with different accents, with different life stories, with different values. That's a very different Britain, a very different set of vibes. And that's important because support for Scottish independence has very little to do with how you feel about being Scottish. It's about how you feel about being British. So that's the second thing I think we should be looking at. The third thing I want to put on your radar, touched on it slightly earlier on, is next year's general election. And my message to you is this. No matter how badly the SNP are going to do next year, and they're going to do badly, it doesn't really matter. Uh, let me explain what I mean. There's a growing disconnect in Scottish political 
world between how Scots vote in Westminster elections and how they vote in Holyrood elections. And this is worth bearing in mind because next year in the general election, the SNP, like I say, could do very badly indeed. They could have an awful time. The latest opinion polls show Labour and the SNP neck and neck, but that disguises the true state of play. You have to remember Labour's vote is highly concentrated in the urban central belt, especially in the West. SNP support is much more widely spread across Scotland. So if the parties are neck and neck in national polls, um, Labour will be on track to win more seats than the SNP uh, for the first time since 2010. And this will be one of the big stories of the election, the, the return of uh, Scottish Labour. And there'll be a big hoo-ha about this, and there'll be calls for Hamza Yusuf's resignation. But let me tell you a secret. You know, Westminster elections don't mean diddly squat in Scottish politics. Look at Nicola Sturgeon in 2017 at the general election there on her watch, the SNP lost 21 seats. That was almost 40% of the party's MPs. That's a disaster in anybody's book. And yet she survived, and at the next Holyrood election, she increased the number of SNP MSPs and secured her, tightened her party's grip on power. Another example is in 2010, at the general election then, the SNP only won 19% of the vote in 2010. And yet the following year, uh, at the Scottish elections, they had a landslide and swept to a majority position under Alex Salmond in the Scottish Parliament. So Scottish politics, when they look at in, in a Westminster context, election context, Scottish politics in a Holyrood election context are very different indeed. So the moral of this story, it's okay for the SNP to do badly in Westminster elections, as long as they bounce back for the Holyrood elections. And this isn't, this, why is this insight important? I think it'll feed into whether Hamza Yusuf's job is at risk next year after an SNP calamity. Some in the party will urge Kate Forbes to challenge him. Uh, they'll think this is the moment for a, for, a, for a leadership challenge. I think she'd be daft to make such a move. My prediction is there won't be a challenge, and if there is a challenge, it will fail. Because for the SNP, Westminster doesn't really matter. What matters is Holyrood. And the election Hamza can't afford to lose it's the next Holyrood election in 2026, just three years away. So those are my three takeaways for you this morning. One, Scotland is falling out of love with the SNP. Two, the vibes about British being British are about to change. And three, the SNP will get a kicking next year, but it won't matter. <laughs> and that's even a good point to ask for your questions. I ask with some trepidation. Um, so, Thank you. Questions from the floor? Questions from the floor. They're not, oh, it fell there. Um, Kenny, is it not a slide? You're sorry, can you wait for the mi microphone? Thank you. Please tell us who you are as well, please. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Richard Marsh from uh, Leith Agency. Um, I was just wondering if there's a slight contradiction between your second and third uh, point there, because if we get a Labour government in at Westminster and that vibe becomes more positive to be British again, does that not mean that the SNP might not do as well at the next Hollywood election if people in Scotland think it's better to be British again? Um, yeah, I'm delighted you're here from the Leith Agency. My son is in the advertising industry and he started his, his career at Leith many years ago and it was a fantastic uh, place to, to learn about the business and does, does great work. So thank you and congratulations for that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th I think we have to accept that, that Scottish politics is not as rigid as we sometimes think it is. We have this view of Scottish politics as too... Uh, as a very binary thing, you're either a yes or, or you're no. You're either, you know, a kind of a believer in independence or you're not. You're either a die-hard SNP person or you're a die-hard Tory or a die-hard unionist. The, 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 we have this idea of a very set and aspect uh, um, uh, world. 
It's just not true, you know? And happily, voters are contrary. And Scotland is complex, and people are complex. And they are able to pat their head and rub their tummy at the same time and hold different views in their heads and be, and, and contradict, and be contradictory. And thank goodness for that. That's, that's, you know, human beings are wonderful creatures. So, you know, the, 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 you're, you're right, there is a, a, the, the possible contradiction there. But that, that, that is within a contradiction within the Scottish electorate. The Scottish electorate is increasingly capable of voting for different parties at different elections. Okay? The idea that Scottish politics is this one, uh, you know, kind of two tribes, is largely a, a product of what happened after 2014, after the referendum. And there, there, was, there, was, there was certain truth in it. But, you know, one in five yes voters is now a no voter. One in, no, one, in fi one in five no voters is now a yes voter. There's a huge churn. And you know, the people who actually just believe one thing or the other are actually a minority on either side. There's a, happily, the, 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 there's a big chunk in the middle of Scot Scottish voters who are capable, in fact, willing and enthusiastic about ideas and changing their mind. And thank goodness for that. Another question. You're not the most shy bunch. Yes, chat up with them. Firstly, thank you, Kenny. It's really good to hear. My name is Derek Christie. I work for Siemens Gamesa, Siemens Energy. I do at present. The uh, SNP have to rely on the Greens for certain things. Sorry, I, 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 I'm sorry the SNP have to rely on the Green Party yeah. to do more. Do you see after 2026 having to be more? collaboration done across many parties? Um, depends on the result, uh, I would say. I mean, the, the, uh, I wonder if the SNP needed to, to uh, go into partnership with the Greens. The SNP administration, when it was a minority administration in 2007 to 2011, was a very successful parliament, a very successful government, had things to do, had, um, had a clarity, of, uh, of, of vision, and it did, did very popular things um, very successfully. Um, it actually did all the popular things very early and ran out of popular things to do, but there was, there was, a, there was, a, there was a real dynamism about that administration. Um, when you are in partnership with another party, it becomes complicated. And the, 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 the negotiations that brought about the SNP Green administration were long and complex, but they weren't long and complex enough, you know. And it, it handed the, the the SNP government many hostages to fortune, and uh, it hadn't been stress tested, it hadn't been red teamed uh, enough for the political dangers that it brought around. So I think lessons will have been learned from that, and um, I would think that we are more likely to see in future minority administrations rather than. Um, uh, Coalitions. It's not a full blown coalition, but it's there. Um, if, for example, uh, in 2026, Labour were the largest party in Scotland, which is entirely possible, I don't think you would see a Labour uh, 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 um, Lib Dem administration like there was in the early days of the devolution. I think you would see um, a minority administration that says, this is what we're going to do either vote for it or, or oppose it and uh, take its chances in the parliament. It's a, it's a risky way of to, 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 to uh, live a parliamentary life and, it's, and, it's, and it, it, it has a, a degree of jeopardy it's, uh, on, on, on parliamentary business, but politically it allows you that clarity and allows you defensibility um, in, your, in, in your whole uh, policy outlook. Is that all right? Guy up there. Thanks very much, Kenny. Um, John McClellan here. Uh, Hello, John. Hello, My old boss. Uh, uh, director of the Scottish Newspaper Society. Uh, Kenny, it, it, we're, it's an advertising conference, so simple messaging is what we're all about. Um, so do you think that saying that Westminster elections don't matter diddly squat in Scotland compared to the holiday elections is actually an oversimplification? And the reason I would argue that it is, is because if you look at the 2017 outcome and then what happened in 2021, there's, there's three big things happened. 
One, the Prime Minister in London went from Theresa May, who was benign in Scotland, to Boris Johnson, who wasn't. Uh, two, Brexit kicked in um, and people began to see what the reality of it was, which they didn't know in 2017. And thirdly, and possibly most importantly, Ruth Davidson left. So what I would argue, and perhaps you care to comment, is that the Westminster elections produce a reaction in the Scottish elections because they're, they're part of a series. So they're, not inter, inter, they're not unrelated uh, and they do matter, but what happens in Westminster does have a direct effect on what happens at a Scottish election. That's an entirely fair point, and not for the first time, uh, John McClellan disagreeing with me fundamentally. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and that, 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 all those things that you said are true. I would go back to the other example I gave, John, which was in 2010, when um, the SNP just won 19% of the vote, then the next year, uh, when it moved from Holyrood, uh, from Westminster to Holyrood, they had this massive landslide uh, of, of a like that Scottish politics hadn't seen. Um, the, this idea of, of, of people alternating between SNP and Labour, uh, depending on, the, on which parliament we're voting for, was a feature right from 1999 right through into the 2010s. Um, and it was, a, uh, it was, you can just, the, the graph goes like this, you know. There was a whole chunk of people who would vote SNP for Holyrood, but they'd vote for a Labour Prime Minister at um, a, a, a Westminster election. Now, that pattern was disrupted by the independence refer referendum. But I think that interruption was a blip, and we are now returning to that jagged tooth pattern. Um, and it, it, it makes sense, and it, it talks to the point I was mentioning earlier about Scottish voters being sentient beings, you know, intelligent thinking beings who are capable of changing their minds, capable of thinking on, in uh, having a twin track view of politics, depending on which parliament they're talking about. But, uh, the, but thank you, thank you for your call, and thank you for the challenge. <laughs> right, thank you very much. For All right, time. thank you. Ken Foster.